very pleased I'm very pleased to speak to you today um, around the topic of research integrity and um, particularly from the view of Clarivate. Um, and so, yes, let me dive right in. I'm going to shop, stop sharing my camera um, just um, to, to save some bandwidth and make sure that you can all hear me throughout this presentation. Um, if you have any questions, please ask in the chat and um, I'm, I will try to, to keep some, some time open so that we can break at the end of the session um, for a bit of a Q&A and conversation around this. So firstly, who we are as Clarivate. Um, Clarivate works in different areas, um, but most pertinent today is in terms of what we do in the academic um, and research um, and government space, um, specifically around research. And we support institutions in um, accelerating research breakthroughs and increasing student success. Um, from the area of driving research excellence across your institution, empowering your researchers to tackle today's global challenges, and simplifying enterprise workflows to improve decision making with an evidence based approach. Um, research integrity obviously comes, um, you know, very important in terms of all of these different areas um, that we work in. Um, and um, a few years ago, Clarivate um, and some of our ISI and our editorial team um, released this report. I've got it aside. Um, it's called Global Research um, Report, Research Integrity, Understanding Our Shared Responsibility for a Sustainable um, Scholarly ecosystem. Um, a lot of what I'm going to share today is available also in this report and um, I've borrowed from the report um, to sort of inform the conversation today um, and we will share the link to this report because it's very interesting um, for all of you. Um, and what I'm going to cover today is just an introduction to research integrity. Um, I understand that this is going to be a series and so I'm very, very pleased to have been invited to kick off um, the research integrity series by WIS. Um, and then to go into why is research integrity so important? Why is it undermined? Um, and then shared stakeholder responsibilities. Who are the actors at play and what are all of our re responsibilities? And then a little bit about how technology data and analytics can help um, and the way that Clarivate um, has participated in kind of the research integrity agenda um, globally for several years. Um, so to sort of introduce the topic of research integrity. Um, much of the value of research is attributed to a shared ideology of integrity. So what we expect from research is that it is conducted in an honest and ethical way, that it is founded on sound methodology, um, that it is, um, you know, um, undergone um, rigorous peer review processes, and that it has results that can be trusted, replicated, and built on. You know, that's very much um, the foundations of the scientific method. Scholarly publishing plays a crucial role in the dissemination of academic research, which is obviously so important um, for all of the players within this research space. Um, following a publication of a particular research, um, it then is evaluated um, by different actors through different means. And through this evaluation process, there is a lot of ways in which um, you can also have um, in unethical behavior being incentivized because of how research is evaluated. Um, when we're talking about research misconduct for the purpose of, of my presentation today, um, it's generally referred to or defined as the fabrication, falsification, and, plagiarize, um, and plagiarism, also known as FFP. So most organizations um, will refer to it as this FFP. Um, in proposing, performing, or reviewing research, or in reporting research results. So keep in mind um, that, that that area of fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism. But I mean, it, it can spend, um, stem broader. It's not a simple concept to define, you know, and it also there's case-by-case -case basis um, that needs to be looked at when we're looking at the, the area of um, research integrity. So why is it so important to the research community? Um, you know, ethical research practices and publications, you know, really allow for a formal basis of scrutiny and a shared 
history of discovery um, that we expect can be critically examined, used as a basis for the formulation of new ideas and the recognition of contribution. So where researchers who have participated in um, particular pieces of research, particular publications, we use this to really recognize them for their contribution to science. And of the veracity of the publication record is really crucial here, um, especially when it comes to the long term sustainability of research. So there's this famous quote, I've got it at the side, um, if I have ever seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And that's from Newton um, many, many centuries ago. But, you know, it really shows and speaks to, to the way that, that research works. You know, research is founded on previous research. And so that research really needs to be trusted. Um, you know, with every year, more and more research outputs are produced. Um, and this is added to, you know, a global knowledge base, you know, information in general, you know, is being, um, you know, added to and each year research is the same. And it utilizes or references previous works. So it really is important that these previous works are trusted, can be challenged, um, you know, and can add to further research. Any um, actor that is acting in an unethical way when it comes to research um, is really polluting the record. And that puts at risk a lot of things, including future research that is built on that research, um, that work that might be um, polluted. It undermines aspects of open science and it frustrates those who seek to utilize it in a practical session. So here um, I'm going to show you a graph. So when we're looking at the, the web of science, we can see that this area of research integrity um, is very much um, you know, a topic of interest, of rising interest within the academic community itself. So here you can see, um, you know, up and um, back to 1982, you can see the sharp rise in terms of research integrity and um, or interest or publications um, produced around research integrity because it obviously is becoming a hot topic um, for um, for academia itself, and rightly so. So what is research misconduct or unethical practices? Um, you know, I've, I've given you that, that, that FFP um, definition, but when it comes to what it actually is, you know, it is a broad spectrum of behaviors that could be covered under research misconduct. So from really, you know, minor incursions, you know, very, very small things um, that, that might not be as, um, as impactful or have as much wider con um, um, wider consequences. So for instance, we can look at a researcher adding a superfluous record um, of a reference to their earlier work, you know, in order to increase their citations, they don't see it as being too difficult. It doesn't really cause any massive problems, and, but that is a form of research misconduct. And then down to real, um, you know, malpractice, you know, really fabricating um, clinical re trial results, you know, which is quite major, you know, which is fraud. And so there is this spectrum to look at. And, you know, we're finding that generally the, 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 um, the, the, the desire to act on misconduct um, in ethics is very much dependent on how, um, you know, where it is within the spectrum, where it falls within the spectrum. So to give you a couple of examples, um, real world examples of, of research misconduct um, that we've experienced uh, or seen. Um, so um, one such example is Andrew Wakefield's vaccine connection. So in 1998, he published a paper in a very famous journal, Lancet, um, and he claimed that, the re that his research found a connection between autism and the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. Um, and that, um, you know, took the world by storm, you know, it um, gained a lot of press and public, you know, the public was aware of this um, study and it undermined the confidence in vaccines. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of um, um, mothers or, or, or families decided not to vaccinate their children because they were afraid of this connection. And then upon investigation, it was actually discovered that he'd altered the facts of his study. And he was paid by a lawyer who was actually planning to sue the manufacturer of the vaccine. Um, so this really speaks to how, um, you know, research Fraud within research can have widespread consequences because they actually found that there was an increase in measles, mumps, and rubella um, 
in um, children um, over this period. And we can still see the effects today, you know, where I, I've personally, you know, seen this study cited today. And even though it has been proven false, um, you still see it, you know, in, in news and it really has reached, you know, the public, you know, beyond just the scholarly community. Another example is um, one thing that we discovered actually within Clarivate. Um, um, our team in Russia at the time, they discovered um, that there was a website, a Russian company was offering authorship on papers um, for, for a fee. So a researcher could pay $500 or more um, and through that actually have um, their name added to an authorship on a pay, on a journal, um, you know, on a publication that was already selected by a journal. So generally the way it would work is um, a res or a group of researchers or one researcher would submit a paper, you know, founded on, you know, they were actually researchers and they actually got accepted by this paper, um, by this journal. That was maybe indexed, you know, in Scopus or Web Science or wherever. And then from there, they would sell out um, an authorship towards this paper because what you're allowed to do is um, you're allowed to actually add authorship after a journal um, um, selects your publication. Um, and so they took advantage of this loophole and you were able to actually pay for this. Um, luckily, Clarivate was able to, to spot it and, and you can find out more about it at Retraction Watch. Um, bringing it closer to home, you know, we have um, a similar, you know, we're, you know, we're all globalized and, and South Africa also faces its challenges around predatory publishing, for instance, you know, um, especially within the context of South African um, research environment where subsidies are given to universities for publications within specific lists. Um, and CREST, um, which is a bibliometric um, school housed um, out of Stellenbosch University. In 2017, they released a paper and they, they showed that 4,246 publications and 48 journals were suspected of predatory practices. Um, so this is quite worrying because the, those, those publications obviously received subsidies and were paid out um, by um, the Department of Higher Education. Um, and, and obviously the publications that they were actually um, in, you know, were, um, had suspicious behavior. So why is research integrity undermined? You know, I think that there's, there's obviously, it's, it's clear, you know, in different ways and for different actors, but the critical con um, context to understand is the wider research environment. You know, there's this pressure to perform, there's this pressure to publish, you know, that famous phrase, phrase publish or perish. Um, and the wider environment is really a key driver. So particularly when you look at how, um, you know, decision makers make decisions around where, um, you know, funding bodies, national bodies, government policies around research, um, performance appraisals, rankings, all take into consideration um, assessment measures. And usually this results, um, you know, this is, takes a look at research output, right? So some metrics that, that these um, decision makers look at is um, the journals that are published, the number of publications, the funding that's been awarded to a specific researcher or institution, um, the citations to that research publications, and then metrics that are drawn out of that, you know, like H index, so or journal impact factor, for instance. Um, and there, you know, this, these, these, these measurements are used by these decision makers and really make um, are important for all players within the research ecosystem. Um, and they're used for performance appraisals, you know, at a university level, um, they're used for rankings. So in, you know, students who decide where to go um, or which, which university you apply for might be using rankings and you know these bibliometric or other indicators are used for rankings so obviously there is an incentive kind of baked into the research ecosystem um, that, that, in, that incentivizes um, performers in this place of this space to really make the best use and sometimes that can result in um, taking advantage um, of loopholes within the system and really conducting things um, in a, 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 a problematic um, way or you know conducting misconduct within research. So the stakeholders who play a role in upholding research integrity, um, everybody, you know, I, I'm sure we have many of these stakeholders on the, the, the session today, but it really is a, a, 
a problem that requires a holistic solution um, by different stakeholders. So you have researchers themselves who are conducting research, who are um, performing peer review on other research, who are editors of academic journals um, who play that critical role. You have journals themselves who are, um, you know, who take participate in the peer review process, who are integral parts of um, the dissemination of research. You have publishers who then house these journals and play a part in terms of their processes, in terms of the journals that they select, um, in terms of the researchers that they, you know, select for their editorial boards. Institutions, you know, universities or science councils obviously come into play. Um, they have, institutions have, um, you know, uphold integrity for their students, for their researchers, um, um, within the, the grants that they award, um, within the, the due diligence that they, they ensure that all of their researchers undertake and the ethical behavior and standards that they insist from their researchers. Government itself, you know, um, as we sort of touched upon, um, government policy and funding environments really play a role. You know, when money's at play, um, you know, people will do a lot of things and be very creative around how they work the system. And, you know, we can see this done, um, you know, within the South African context, but also globally, you know, it's particularly um, in this proliferation of predatory publishing. Um, that's being taken advantage of. And then um, database and analytics providers, you know, like ourselves at Clarivate, we obviously play a role in terms of, um, you know, how we index journals, how we, um, you know, showcase the metrics that we use and really ensure that we're being very transparent in how um, the metrics we, we, we um, showcase to the world that are used for the, by these important decision makers across the board, um, you know, and really ensure that we're also, you know, practicing what we're preaching um, and being transparent around how we um, ensure um, research integrity within our own institutions, uh, within our own organization, and also in the, the products um, and databases and analytic solutions that we produce and provide to our customers. There are many areas or stages within the research process um, that need to, where we need to ensure integrity, right? So this is just a little bit of a slide that showcases this. So, you know, right from the beginning as a research um, problem, literature review, hypothesis and plan, you know, you want to ensure that the, as a researcher, um, you know, we're enabling um, or, or guiding them on ensuring that the research that they're looking at is credible, you know, that it's, that it's um, you know, followed peer review standards and we need to be advising, you know, even students around this problem. Um, at the research and experimental stage and data select collection, obviously, you know, that's kind of where we know a lot about, um, you know, fraud or that sort of thing or, or, or falsif falsifying research results. Um, but there's also, you know, an issue sometimes um, research misconduct can happen in such a way where it's not purposefully done, but it is, um, you know, it, it comes about because um, there's there's an, a misunderstanding around what needs to happen. And that's why we need to be ensuring um, that all, all players within the research space are aware of best practices around this. Um, in terms of manuscript manuscript preparation, you know, going now once the research is out, um, you know, where the choice of publication. Um, so, for instance, you know, in the South African research context, where there is these, you know, D hit lists to ensure, you know, that each um, publication is is taken a, a look at and scrutinized and um, for their peer review process, editorial boards, you know, really to understand the journals that we're publishing in, or that we're we're kind of accepting that our researchers are publishing in. And then when that, once that publication is, is out, to really understand, um, you know, what metrics are used, what measurements are used, how they are drawn, um, you know, and the, the kind of um, metadata that's used and ensure that they're ethically um, or fairly collected um, and that fair metrics are used. So research integrity is ultimately a shared responsibility. You know, we've gone through the different stakeholders um, responsible for upholding research integrity, and each has different um, responsibilities, you know, when it comes to this place. Um, so 
for researchers, journals, and publishing, they need to, their responsibility, you know, is when they're performing research itself, you know, when they're performing literature reviews, when they're confirming references are legitimate, they're checking the journals, um, you know, to identify uh, um, and validate the claims of the journals, you know, it's not just enough to, to, to go into the website and see these claims and, and because it says it's peer review, you know, you really want to take extra careful of where you're publishing um, and which journals you're working with. You know, verifying author identities and affiliations, um, validate the provenance of experimental data, um, you know, obviously, which, which is top of mind for journals, you know, to, or to ensure that proper peer review is followed. Um, screen images, validate contributions, perform plagiarism detective, detection, and uphold statistical validity. Um, so those are just some of the areas that researchers, journals, and publishers are expected um, to, to, to play and really provide intervention and be proactive in their approach um, to their responsibility um, with regards to these activities. For institutions, funders, and governments, you know, provide training, capacity building, and support. Um, create policies that, um, you know, allow for appropriate behavior um, and take punitive action when needed. And then use appropriate metrics to support um, decision making. Um, and don't just look at metrics, you know, as I'm saying, as, as, as we've discussed, you know, um, you know, use the use metrics where necessary, but also understand that that that, that the environment or pushing for only one particular metric, you know, can really um, create an environment where 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 um, plays within the space or take advantage of that, um, you know, in different ways and uh, produce sort of unethical results. And then for database and analytics providers, you know, provide trustworthy data sets um, and produce responsible metrics. Um, and we've sort of touched upon that. So now looking at how technology, data, and analytics can play a role um, or help, you know, and facilitate this, this move towards um, healthy or, or, or um, um, research integrity. Um, so one of the things is looking at self-citation analysis. Um, and self-citations, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting topic to actually delve into um, because self-citations, um, you know, we expect some level of self-citations in a publication record. You know, a researcher cites themselves and that's kind of expected or a journal cites themselves and that's also expected, um, you know, to some extent. But we can really use data to understand, okay, what is the norm? Um, of self-citations and when do things, you know, um, go sort of um, outside of that norm and when, so we can identify, okay, utilizing, you know, big data sets, we can, we can understand which um, publications or which self-citations, um, you know, are, are, are sort of outliers um, in this. And, you know, sometimes, you know, self-citations are very normal and each one needs to be looked at individually. You know, it's not just about saying, okay, this is, you know, out of the norm in terms of self-citation, so it must be unethical. So, for instance, um, um, a few years ago, I was speaking to a researcher um, in the Western Cape, and she was studying a particular type of fame boss. Um, and so she was saying, you know, that basically a lot of her work that she produces, you know, um, has self-citations because she's basically the only researcher globally, you know, who's studying this particular plant. Um, and so, you know, that's expected. And that's why everything, you know, it's not just about, you know, having this indicator for problematic behavior, you know, it really needs to be analyzed, it really needs to be looked at um, on a case by case basis. So we're ensuring, um, you know, that, that, that certain contexts are taken into account. So for instance, um, some of my colleagues at ISI, um, they looked at the cohort of highly cited researchers published in 2019 um, to understand you know, what is normal rates of self-citation and what is excessive rates. So this is what this graph in front of you shows. You know, there's this, um, so you can see, you know, where the, within all of these researchers, you know, you can take sort of average and say, okay, that's accepted rates of self-citations. And then you can see, you know, out of this very big data set, there are, you know, these three extreme 
extreme outliers in terms of their self-citations. And so this is really something that, that we can use and it can help us um, you know, discover okay, who we need to you know, take a closer look at. Um, another way is spotting coordinated journal citation um, manipulation. So um, at Clarivate and with the Web of Science, um, one of our um, sort of most well-known solutions is journal citation reports and particularly the metric journal impact factor, which is an important metric. It's not a perfect metric, um, it's a, but it's an important metric within the research ecosystem because it's really used to understand a journal's performance and um, researchers utilize this, you know, to discover which journals they should be publishing in, you know, which where they can select. And then um, also in terms of their assessment, researchers are often Often assessed by um, the journal impact factor of the publications um, that they um, that they um, have research or publications in, which journals they they publish in. And since its release in 1975, um, we've provided really transparent data around how um, self citations work and how they um, um, you know come into effect and can actually change the 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 um, journal, the metrics that come about. So we're very, very careful of looking at this and understanding what self-citation means. Um, in a journal context, you know, we, we discussed it in terms of researchers, but for a journal context, um, you know, self-citations also come into play. So we, we see this proliferation of this concept often known as um, um, journal cartels. And basically what they are is they're groups of journals, um, you know, who will, decide together that they will encourage their researchers or include citations to each other's journals, basically in order to increase overall citations. Um, and you know these 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 rep when they when they cite they they, they partner journal, um, you know, it is not you know based on sound research. It's not actually because that piece of research contributed to their 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 research. You know, it's just a really superfluous add of a citation, you know, for the sake of, of increasing their citations. Um, and that can really, really um, um, create a mess in terms of your journal impact factor. And um, so we, we, we definitely, it's something that we look at as Clarivate. Um, and as soon as we, we notice this sort of trend, so all of the journals that, that are indexed in the web of science are, con are consistently monitored each year. And as soon as we notice trends like that, we actually exclude them in the journal um, impact factor results for that year because they also, um, you know, mess up the normalized rates for the entire, you know, cohort of journals. And so it's very, very important um, that, that we notice this, and we're, luckily we're able to look at this um, and or, or, or circumvent this utilizing big data and analytics. Um, plagiarism detection, um, obviously this software is used by most universities at a student level, um, but then also, um, you know, for editorial um, submissions, you know, um, utilizing this, this um, kind of software allows for more, but it's, you know, it also, you know, each is a case by case basis and there is um, sometimes, um, you know, things that can be noted um, with plagiarism detection, but actually, um, you know, sometimes um, it's not actually plagiarism. Sometimes it's referring to a particular um, piece of research or, you know, we stand on the shoulder of giants. So it, it gets, um, you know, sometimes on a case by case basis, there, there's like room for movement or room for debate within what is covered under plagiarism. Um, but of course, like copy and paste is not allowed um, and it should be referenced and all of sources should be referenced. And so um, software really helps um, a, the research community to, um, to detect this. Um, image manipulation is also something that we've been seeing a kind of proliferation of, particularly in the biomedical field. So what will happen is, um, you know, in particular research areas that use a lot of imagery, you know, these images can be, um, you know, changed or filtered or done, you know, you know, basically um, not given in its raw form. Um, and so there's been this push, you know, for, you um, or journals or publishers to really have a clear policy around what constitutes image manipulation. Um, you know, and it's also one of those things that is a spectrum, you know, of what that means or what the results, you know, of a particular image um, manipulation might mean for a particular paper. 
Um, looking at anomalous reviewer activity, technology can also help with this, software can help with this. Um, so much the same way as you get sort of fake Twitter accounts or face fake Facebook accounts that we hear so much about, you know, bot attacks and that sort of thing. You also have um, sort of fake reviewer accounts that can happen. So a researcher might a um, um, submit a paper and then um, actually try to review their own paper or have um, you know colleagues review it and so um, there's ways to kind of check this out and that's why we also need to check veracity in terms of the accounts that we look at um, and um, you know utilizing um, you know technology can help you do this software can help you do this databases um, like Publons on the web of science and um, that tracks and is really um, transparent around reviewer activity um, can help with this, but it's obviously an uphill battle because so much of peer review is done, you know, in blind studies. So, um, you know, it's not, it's not very clear who a reviewer is. And so there's all interesting ways um, to use profiling systems like Publons to really um, authenticate review. And then in terms of authoring tools, you know, ensuring that researchers, when they're writing their manuscripts themselves, are um, able to reference correctly, cite um, the work that they're using um, correctly. And so one of the, the tools that we have within Clarivate, but there's several different ones out there, is called EndNote. Um, and it really helps to, to ensure that um, references are correctly cited, stored, and then also they can use indexing services um, to understand um, which um, articles might have been retracted, um, you know, and to ensure that journal quality um, is there from the, the research that they're, um, that they're citing or referencing within their, their own research. Um, in terms of Clarivate's participation in this space, um, there are several, you know, things that I've touched upon today, but I think what we're really known for um, as Clarivate is the Web of Science core collection and our very robust um, and transparent journal evaluation process um, and um, metadata collection. So we're known as the gold standard and that's why I'm, I'm very pleased that we were invited you know, to kick off this session on research integrity because it's, because it's something that's really at the foundation of what we do in all of our research solutions um, that we provide to the academic community. So just to take you through a little bit around the journal evaluation process, um, you know, our process is unique. Um, it is um, very transparent. We're guided by the legacy of Eugene Garfield, who really um, sort of um, invented um, the, the field of bibliometrics and um, citation indexing. And the principles of our journal selection remain the same. So objectivity, um, selectivity and collection dynamics. Um, and objectivity is really critical. You know, we are an unbiased player. Clarivate is not a publisher. And so when we, um, you know, produce or, or select journals, you know, it really is based on our selection criteria. Clarivate is not a publisher and so doesn't have a stake, you know, in the game around promoting particular journals or publications in any way. Um, and we adapt to the changes in the publishing landscape, you know, um, as things evolve, as technology evolve, we take this into account. Um, our, we're very transparent around our journal selection process, um, and we spend a lot of time, you know, connecting with the academic publishing community to share ideas, to understand where the challenges are, and to also inform them around what we expect in terms of our indexing standards um, and for, for um, integrity within the research space. Um, we have a team of publisher neutral in-house editors um, who are you know, specialists in their field, speak many languages um, and are not currently you know, publishing or participating in the space. Um, you know, from that side so that they can really, you know, come in, um, you know, in an unbiased way. Each editor is focused on a specific subject category um, with a deep and nuanced understanding of the journals within that field. Um, editors have no conflicts of interest. As I was saying, you know, there's no affiliation to a particular publish house or research institute. Um, 
And this contrasts with the approach taken by other databases, you know, that rely heavily on algorithmic approaches. And, you know, we are, you know, we're, we're very much into data as the company that we work with, but we also understand that, you know, you need to take a human eye and you need specialized approach. So you should be coupling the data analysis with also real people who can take a more nuanced approach um, to advising what, um, 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 journals um, are following particular practices. So um, in a nutshell, we have 28 selection criteria in total, um, 24 quality criteria, and then we have four impact criteria. And in impact here, we're talking about citation analysis. So we take a look at a lot of different things. Um, and all of these quality standards here need to be met, um, as well as all the impact criteria in terms of citation analysis to be entered into um, the Web of Science primary collection, um, which includes the, the um, Social Science Citation Index, the Science Citation Index, and the Arts and Humanities Citation Index. Once a publication has met the quality criteria, it then actually is included in the Web of Science core collection um, and becomes part of the Emerging Sources Citation Index. Okay, and then, but only when it meets the, the, the impact criteria does it um, um, enter into the, the um, three primary indexes. But that's a whole other sort of conversation. So what's in store for the future um, when we look at um, the space of research integrity? Um, you know, I hope that I've, I've, I've done enough today to really share that, you know, a collective and proactive effort is required, you know, to address opportunities for misconduct, to understand why they're taking place, to understand what um, loopholes they're exploiting, and then really be proactive. And I think responsibility is, is a critical thing because there are so many players, um, and many players are incentivized sometimes to participate in misconduct, um, you know, then it's, it's, it's really about who takes accountability and each of us need to see where, um, you know, our responsibilities lie and ensure um, that we're proactively circumventing any opportunity for misconduct. You know, open research mandates more transparency um, that will in turn influence the expectation of, repeatable, um, of repeatability in terms of methodology, um, rigor, and data visibility, you know, and luckily with the internet, um, you know, everything is available and everything is scrutinized. And so even though the, the internet allows for, you know, a lot of, you know, playing around or, um, you know, opportunities for misconduct, it also, you know, means additional rigor to, um, you know, where, where misconduct is spotted and published um, very quickly um, and discussed um, within the research community. Um, it's going to become more and more pertinent for those holding budgets um, to be proactive in this space. You know, funders and institutions are demanding um, that research is produced and published in different forums um, and, you know, the, within that open access movement. And so, you know, as they encourage this and as they are the budget and purse holders, they really are going to also have to be, um, you know, really proactive in how they're guiding their researchers in terms of where they, this, these, these um, um, research outputs um, or research data sets should be published. Um, database based providers like Clarivate, you know, need to ensure that they're being transparent in their evaluation criteria and metrics. We touched upon this, you know, the Web of Science core collection and journal selection process is here to stay. Um, and we still continue, you know, on that, that um, mission of ensuring um, the high journal selection process that we're known for. And, you know, new evaluation frameworks really need to kind of learn from what's been done, trying to, um, you know, learn from um, ways that, that misconduct has proliferated and be agile and really understand, okay, you know, if they've been using particular bibliometric indicators, you know, they need to ensure that they're carefully considered, they need to ensure um, that, 
um, you know, that a range of indicators are looked at, that also it's not just metrics and it's not just indicators, but really, you know, um, special, special um, people and human beings within that area can take a closer look and really understand, you know, um, what is considered misconduct, um, you know, and how it can be um, overcome within this space. And then lastly, some, some takeaways um, that, that I hope to share with you today is, you know, how to help your institution to safeguard research integrity. So I mentioned um, the report that we released, it's freely available on our website for download. Um, we also have um, something called the Web of Science Academy, and it has online courses um, that are freely available to researchers, to students, um, to um, staff members within the institution, um, on a range of different topics. And we have um, several going around research integrity. Um, so the one is called good citation behavior. Um, another one is called an introduction to ethical publishing behavior. We also have you know, courses around peer review and how to conduct peer review. And all of these things are very important. And these are freely available. Um, you know, we're also speaking to, to institutions where some of them are actually bringing um, um, some of the, these courses into their, their curricula um, for emerging researchers or for you know, established researchers um, to ensure um, that students are aware um, of these things and are, are really, and so, so that's something that's very interesting for the Web of Science Academy. Please have a visit and please let us know um, um, your thoughts on this and how you can bring it into your everyday workflow and inform your researchers. Yes, and that is, um, you know, the end of my presentation around this. Um, I hope it's been informative. Um, and I think now um, we can perhaps break for um, a question and answer session or discussion, you know, around this very, very interesting and fascinating topic. Thank you so much, Tracy. It was very informative indeed. Um, we do have a question. Um, so the question is, how does it affect a researcher who cites a research that is fabricated, false, or has plagiarism, especially if the researcher citing such work is not aware of the mentioned misconduct? Mm -hmm. You see, this is, and this is why this is so important, because it doesn't matter that the researcher was not aware, you know. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, the consequences of that, if they're founding their research on um, you know, on um, on a piece of research that is not, you know, properly peer reviewed and, and, and the veracity is not there, then obviously their research is called into question, um, you know, which is, is, is really problematic. And it's, it's, it's very sad for some researchers who were taken advantage of in this way. Um, I mean, even for institutions themselves, you know, who might be promoting a piece of research that is not founded on, you know, proper science and, you know, the, the um, as we know now with the internet, you know, once it's out there and once you're associated with kind of problematic or unethical behavior, you know, as innocent as you might have been, you know, that can really follow you around, um, you know, within your digital footprint. And it can be very, very difficult to actually let go of something like that or association. It can, it can impact your career. It can impact your reputation, you know, it is um, a very scary thing, actually. And that's why we really need to ensure that we're helping our researchers to understand. And of course, you know, it's not about being completely perfect. Sometimes mistakes are ha happen, you know, and a particular paper might be retracted, you know, and that's, you know, fair. And in many ways, you know, there's the argument within, you know, if a paper is retracted, that is the system working, you know, that is, it's noticed and, um, you know, it's acted upon. And it means that there's, um, you know, th there's some sort of, um, process through which these things are discovered. So it's, it's, it, it, it is on a case by case basis, but it is, you know, very, very problematic. And especially when a researcher is not aware, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's quite a dangerous space. And that's why we're so, uh, you know, I'm very glad that we're having this, this conversation, um, you know, more prolifically throughout the, the academic um, stakeholders. Absolutely. And I think it really touches on the point that you made that research integrity is a shared responsibility and we all have a part to play. So we can't claim sort of ignorance in, in, the, in the matter. Yeah. Um, thank you, Tracy. That is the only question. Um, if I, the, the, 
author or the person who posted the comment is anonymous, but if I can ask the person to send me an email, then I can also share more information regarding this. Thank you so much, Tracy. It was so insightful to learn more about Clarivate's stance on research integrity and also the ways in which we can manage research integrity. And also what was really reassuring was the rigorous journal selection process by Clarivate. So thank you so much for taking the time to share with us. Thank you very much. And please feel free to, to reach me. My, um, my email and contact details um, is on, on the screen. So if you want to discuss this more or you know, have any interesting insights to share, please do so. Thank you so much, Tracy. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye, Tracy. And thank you to, to you online for joining today. Remember to join our session on the 28th of September, the second part of our, our series, and that will be presented by Carga. Enjoy your day, everybody. <laughs>